All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. My name is Ani Gellis. I'm the Community Programs Manager at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. And we're delighted to see you all today for this um, one-hour Zoom webinar. Um, as a reminder, just a bit of housekeeping first. Uh, this is a webinar, so your camera and mic are turned off. But we would love for you to participate in the chat. So feel free to ask questions or if you have your own experiences you'd like to share, feel free to do that. And feel free to test it now by just sharing where you're tuning in from today. Um, and a little bit of background information. Uh, the Baltimore Museum of Industry recently completed a multi-year initiative called the Bethlehem Steel Legacy Project. I invite you to check out our website, the BMI.org, uh, where you'll find our podcast, um, which is called Sparrows Point, an American Steel Story, as well as our blog, which has personal stories about living and working in Sparrows Point. And if you're local to the Baltimore area or if you're up for a road trip, I invite you to come check out our newest long-term exhibition called Fire and Shadow, which is about the rise and fall of Bethlehem Steel in Baltimore. Today's program is part of Steel Weekend, which is oops, um, taking place at the National Museum of Industrial History in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania this weekend. Um, you can find a whole schedule of the interesting programs they have <coughs> on their website, which is nmih.org. And now a little bit about today's presenters. J.M. Giordano, Joe Giordano, is an award-winning photojournalist, and he's also the co-host of a podcast called 10 Frames Per Second. And his book, We Used to Live at Night, is um, chronicle is 25 years of Baltimore at night. His work has been featured in many publications, including NPR, ProPublica, Al Jazeera, GQ, Architectural Digest, and others. And Ed Leskin, Edward Leskin, um, is part of the Steelworkers Archives, the goal of which is to create a permanent community center in Southside Bethlehem for the preservation of the history of steelworkers. So we can hear more about each of them and how they ended up on this path with these projects. Um, again, we'll have time for questions at the end, but feel free to use the chat if you have questions along the way that might inform their presentations. So um, I think that's it from me. So I will turn my mic off and hand it over to Ed. Well, I, I can see, my, it's very rare that I actually see myself uh, actually taking pictures. It's quite exciting. Um, yeah, the, the first thing I want to discuss, um, you know, this whole process, uh, I, I, you know, when I grew up as a young boy, my father, uh, you know, he was in the computer business and he, um, his, one of his main customers uh, was Bethlehem Steel. And over the years, you know, I heard many, many stories of, you know, the, the vast size of the equipment and, and how important it was to the local economy and, and various people that worked at the plant, you know, the, the importance they were, you know, the relationships that were there. And um, what happened is um, uh, when I attended in 1984 to 88, I was at, I was a double major in political science and fine arts at uh, Moravian College. And I became, you know, I, I had studied labor history um, and, um, you know, the idea was, you know, how to merge like fine art creation of, of in my case, uh, it, it it became photography. It started with painting and drawing, but it's, I really became interested in photography. You know, how do you how do you address those issues of economy, of industry, of humanity? And uh, you know, we were literally in the shadow of, of the steel plant. You know, where my art studio was, I, I could hear it pounding away in the distance. You know, it was it was omnipresent, and. Um, I, I applied to uh, graduate school. Uh, for my, we went to Pratt Institute for my master's degree. And uh, what had happened is I, I walked in the footsteps of Walker Evans. You know, I walked at that famous uh, cemetery overlooking the uh, steel plant, took some pictures. And uh, as soon as I came back with that stuff, my thesis professor, uh, his name was Phil Perkis. Um, he, he said, you got to go back there. And, and that's, I never stopped uh, even to this day. Um, you know, it started with the, with the gravestones, you know, looking at the ethnic uh, makeup of the area, the religion, it was, it was very important, you know, when you could read that. And then it, it, it started with uh, um, the structures, um, the various things that you would see um, 
in the distance and then ultimately gravitated towards the people and taking images of, of people that actually work there. And um, after that time, that period, I did some world travel um, and did some stuff with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And I, I became interested again because there was a theater production that was that was being produced by Cornerstone Theater in Los Angeles and Touchstone Theater in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And, and the production was called Steelbound. And it was a, um, it was based on the character Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus was the steel worker that was chained up on, on top of this enormous steel ladle that they, they brought in uh, um, to the old iron foundry building. And um, the whole thing was about the struggle of, of, of getting away from the past and coming into the future. And, and the whole thing was about this man ripping off his chains and, and, and freeing himself and moving on to the future. But the, in the production, there were people that actually worked at Bethlehem Steel, they were actual steel workers. And they started to open up to me about what, what they'd done. I, took, I started doing portraits. And um, it was at that point I, uh, I became very friendly with the direction of Touchstone Theater of a gentleman by the name of Bruce Ward. And uh, he was already uh, videotaping and, and, and documenting this. He had worked for Bethlehem Steel for 27 years as a rigger. So we became very friendly with each other and we started this process. And, and what happened over time is we... Um, began to feel that, well, how are we going to present this in the community and other, others like us, you know, people who have stories and artifacts and, and a group of us got together. We formed an organization collectively in 2001 called the Steelworkers Archives. And uh, since that time, you know, we, we've, um, you know, we've gone out to the public, um, we've told stories, uh, um, we collected more artifacts and over time we became very uh, connected with other institutions that started to build themselves and, and became become present in the community uh, the national museum of industrial history um and um and eventually it led to it, it led to me coming down to baltimore <laughs> and, and photographing um these incredible people that i that I had the chance to become acquainted with uh, that, that are absolutely uh, moving in, in what they had to say. Um, you know, one thing that I, I found fascinating about them, you know, they, they absolutely loved what they did. And each one of them, you know, they, you couldn't, they couldn't speak enough about the, the unbelievable scale of everything that, that was presented to them, the machinery, the sounds, and uh, many of them, uh, you know, there, there were quite a few human struggles that they had to deal with. They had to deal with uh, the struggles of economics, uh, struggles with, uh, you know, being so many of them were African American. They had, they had, uh, they had things they had to deal with. That gentleman on the left, I had, a, I had the pleasure to meet Andrew Morton. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm just reading some of his quotations. He, it, well, he's just said it wasn't just a job, it was a love, you know. He said, when I started, I thought I was gonna, I was in a military zone. You know, he says, it's something I had never seen because I was a city kid. A lot of these people, they transition from, from working in their neighborhoods and they, they come into this city within a city that had a, had a totally different dynamic to it. And, and it was like walking on a different planet. Um, and he, he talks about discrimination. You know, one of the things that, that really uh, was amazing, he said, blacks could handle the heat better than the whites, he said to me. That, that was the assumption of some people in, in, uh, in, in leadership at the plant, in corporate leadership, they thought that maybe, maybe they could work a little harder than other people. And, and you know, when you hear something like that, it, it's like, it's absolutely incredible. You know, I'm not a stranger to that myself, you know, in my background, um, you know, I grew up uh, Jewish and, uh, you know, my family had struggles. My father had struggles where he could not um, be employed by certain companies because of who he was. So, you know, when I hear this, uh, these struggles, it, 
to myself, it becomes, it's part of me too. Um, and when I, when I photograph people and when I talk to them, you know, it, it, things like this, when you convey that to them, they really open up. You know, one of the things that I like to do is I like to talk about some of the things that I've done. You know, what I would do is I would, I would bring photographs and, and images and things that are part of my history. And I share that with them and they, they, I will go into a discussion of, you know, what it, what it was like to, on your first day, how did you feel walking through those doors? And, you know, it's amazing how comfortable they become. And, you know, as a photographer, you have to be very, um, everything has to be going on automatic. You have to, all your camera settings, everything, everything has to be, uh, intuitive and you know it's a process that I've uh, I became very comfortable with and the people that uh, that I photograph for are very comfortable and that's part of, of of what we do you know you have that split second uh, you have that moment to capture the image I mean, even though it's a studio environment you really don't have you, you have to be aware of how they're interacting with you and, and that's when the magic happens and sometimes i look back on, on it myself and i'm like how the hell did i do that <laughs> um so we can go through more of these um and some of them that i'm going to go back and i what i've done is i i decided to um to approach the Baltimore uh, steelworkers, I wanted to use color because you know, as soon as as soon as they presented themselves, I I didn't feel that it would it, it could have been expressed any other way, and it's also a way for me to separate the, the two bodies of work. Uh, the one image that you're seeing right now, this is Dave Schwartz. I had a chance to meet him. Uh, he was part of that steel production, uh, steel bound production, that theater production. And, and it was like a, an off moment, you know, when people relax and they're, uh, they're, they're on the sidelines. And, uh, you know, uh, the statement that he, that he made here, I see so the mills rolling normally, you know, many blooms in our spirits up, you know, and, and he goes on and on and talks about when the last piece of steel would come down, how the tears would roll down his eyes. And, you know, now that it's all over, he talks about taking care of, of, of his brothers and sisters, you know, how they were going to not have that way of life again, and they were going to move on, you know, it was really, um, is really an eye opener for me. And that was, I said to myself, you know, after, after completing that portrait, I said, you know, something, this is really something that I wanted to move ahead with. That was the beginning. And now, now, this particular image on the left, um, that was taken in 1989. Uh, this was during the uh, unveiling ceremony, the Steelworkers Memorial, War Memorial, in front of the main gate at the Bethlehem plant. Uh, this was something that was actually built and constructed, but with love and dedication by the Steelworkers themselves. I did not know that that was happening. I, I had just decided to take my camera everywhere. <laughs> and I was like jogging with my camera. I saw all these guys with steel workers coming out uh, with their flags. And I said, oh my God, I hit the jackpot. So I hung out there and I took some pictures of this gentleman on the left. His name is Jack Deutsch. Um, and some years later, uh, uh, back in 2010, 2011, I had a chance to photograph him at, uh, later in life. And how that happened is um, I, we had this picture on display at a local mall. Um, it was a display um, sponsored by the Steelworkers Archives and his, uh, his, um, his daughter and his wife happened to see this picture and they got in touch with me and, it's, and they wanted to present it to him as a Christmas present. So we followed up on it. And uh, I said, you know, I'd like to take a picture of your husband. And, uh, you know, he was a professional boxer. He came very close to fighting uh, Larry Holmes. He had a very successful record uh, in knocking people out. And he would even tell me, and it's like, I, I am a legend in my time. <laughs> but he was like a giant and he was a gentle giant. He, he had a sense of humor and, and he was one of, the, one of the best people that you could ever imagine. And he would jog like 10 miles or something to go to work at, at the steel plant. He was like Rocky 
the Rocky of the Lehigh Valley. And he, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, he passed away. He had a massive heart attack and just um, dropped dead quite sadly. Uh, but, you know, I was very fortunate to be able to get like a then and now of this very, very, very interesting individual. Um, this again on the top, that's the, uh, that was the un unveiling ceremony. They were coming out with their flags and they're all around. And I decided to incorporate an image on the bottom of pretty much the way the main plant entrance looks now. Um, you know, it's all gone. Um, you can see that the sign of Bethlehem plant isn't there anymore. Uh, it's just the passage of time. When we start documenting things like this over a long period, you get that sense. You know, when you first start something, you're not like, how far am I going to go with this? But the years go by and then the body of work starts to take on a life of its own. And if you start to see, oh, my God, look at how things changed. <laughs> and these are the ingot molds. I actually had a chance to, I actually snuck into the plant once when it was functioning and I assumed the identity of a steel worker. One of the people I became friendly with, they were putting themselves through uh, college at Moravian College uh, in the evening and they were working at Bethlehem Steel during the day. So I can get you in. So I dressed the part, you know, and, and I had my work boots and everything. He said, the only thing you have to remember though is when you leave, just look pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't look happy and I walked out of there and uh and uh, nobody asked any questions but I had the chance to photograph and see things that that people didn't have a chance to normally see some of the things that I saw weren't too pretty it looked like some things were in disrepair um the one thing that I wanted to portray in my work I wanted to foreshadow that the end was coming you can see it and, and that wasn't really something that was the most popular thing to display or, or show. As a matter of fact, I had an exhibition in the community. Uh, there was some of the higher ups at Bethlehem Steel saw some of the pictures that I got. And they weren't they weren't very happy about it. <laughs> um, but uh, this was uh, again part of my original thesis work at Pratt Institute. Um, wandering around the streets, uh, it was like a twilight shot. And I happened to come across this couple and this gentleman worked at Bethlehem Steel. We talked about how things are potentially coming to a close. And it was that moment of uncertainty and, and, and what, what's the future gonna be like? And his, his wife, she just clutched her, her, her chest like, my God, what are, what are we gonna do? And it's, it's um, my my thesis professor at Pratt Institute, and when, when he um when he saw this image, he like grabbed it. And he ran down the hall. He had to he had to show everybody, and it, it's never really escaped my memory. And it uh, very uh, very strong. And this one, uh, you know, in my area, a lot of people didn't have a chance. For some reason, I don't see too many photographs of, of this. Uh, uh, this was an area across from the blast furnace is known as Sand Island. And, you know, I, I had to set the camera up on a tripod. And I, at the time I was using the film called Tri-X. And, um, and when I was standing there at the edge of the water, now the, the flame would be like a blue color. It was spooky. But the thing that I remember the most is all the... Uh, the noises that were coming out of there, the churning and the pounding. And, and, and then when that flame would release, it'd be like, shoosh, and you could hear it. And sometimes, you know, you got the impression that there was a battle going on inside the plant between two Greek gods hurling thunderbolts and, and, and throwing hammers. That's what it actually, that's what it actually sounded like. And then sometimes you would hear gases escaping and it would, it would sound like somebody got punched in the gut. And it, it, it was like this thing was alive. That's, that was incredible. And, uh, you know, later on, uh, this particular image was, a, it was a, a combination of like three different negatives that I merged in photograph and uh, in Photoshop, I upsized it. And uh, it actually has to look more of a large format image right now. I didn't have that technology in, in 89 when I took the picture, but uh, now it, uh, it, my visualization of it's complete. So, 
Well, I think that um, that will wrap it up for your portion, Ed, and then we'll turn it over to Joe to share some photos. And then after that, we will have some time for Q&A. So again, I'm sorry about the chat being disabled earlier. Um, so if you do have questions, feel free to send those um, via the chat either now or at the end of Joe's presentation. All right, Joe, turn it over to you. Let All me right, know. let me... Um... Cue these up real quick. Sure. <clears throat> All right. So I um my background's a little different. Um my background's a little different. I grew up um in the steel area of Baltimore. My grandfather is a steel worker. Um my mother still works for an iron fabricator down there. Um <laughs> I didn't go to school for this. I uh I went in the army. Um, but I got out, I, I studied journalism and got a job with a uh, local paper uh, covering the kind of the collapse of the, the local steel industry in the early 2000s. Um, so I, I documented the, the kind of fall as Bearer's point. And then <clears throat> around 2000, well, I guess like yeah, 2015, I started to, to make this more of a national project. 2019, I made the international project. Uh, uh, nationally, I, I've been out to the Ohio Valley, um, to uh, Johnstown and Steubenville and everything along the river. Uh, internationally, I've, I've been to the United Kingdom, which is this photo here was taken in a red car, which is in Yorkshire. Uh, where they, they just, they just uh, imploded the last steel mill up there. Um, and then this recently, I went to the Czech Republic uh, to photograph the, 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 the steel, well, the former steel. Um, kind of communities there that fell apart after the end of communism. Uh, some of them stayed, but like the, the big ones didn't make it. Um, they still they still make steel, but not not as big as they used to in, under communism. So this 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 slide series is um, the pages from my book that's at the Museum of Industry Shuttered. This this covers um, this covers uh, the UK, of course Baltimore, the UK, West Virginia. And it kind of I wanted to tie this international narrative together on how all of these things um, kind of affect each other and, and are happening at the same time. Um, and the, the book was created through some uh, gracious grants by some wonderful benefactors at the museum. Um, so this is the uh, these are I'm I'm going to go through these and then um, if anyone has any questions because uh, I, I don't want to drag this out too long. If anybody has any questions, they can either stop me or we can we can talk about it after. But like I do with my classes, um, I teach high school now, so part time, um, and I'm full. I'm a full time photojournalist, so I'm still working uh, for publications, but I, I teach. So I, I want to go through these real quick, and then we can go back and talk about them. This is um this is a, an annual retirees picnic in uh, Weirton, West Virginia. Uh, this, this, this is um, Mary. She was a um, like third generation steel worker. This is her family's scrapbook. Yeah, that she put together that she showed me um this is a, this is an iron ore pile in uh pure pure ore in in red car the horses you saw at the beginning which run through kind of a narrative of this this whole piece um the the horse would bring the ore from the fields right to the right to the mills right which is kind of wild they just get it from the ground which is kind of cool they got a piece of that um this is pete uh you can see the years he worked there uh, you know, I talk to students, I'm like, they, they can't imagine working at one job for that many years, you know, uh, almost half a cent, almost half a uh, century. Um, is that him in the corner? I'm not telling anybody. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to leave it up to interpretation. Um, hold on. Uh, my, sorry, my share screens. Okay. Um, so we've got after Pete. Uh, this is a mill in, in Johnstown uh, up on the Ohio River. Um, they're pretty abandoned now. I, I think one just reopened. They just they just refired one up there. I, I haven't been back. This, this is this is uh, 2017. Um, this this is Don Kellner. I I really wanted to to show you know the, these retirees uh, who, who were most hit financially when the mills closed around here. They lost their benefits overnight, pretty much. Uh, I wanted to show them it, kind of in, in their residences, in their in their homes, 
and how they were living at the time. Um, this is Don Kellner. He was the head of the retirees, uh, retirees union. This is Roy. Um, now this, well, he's passed away now. And, and unfortunately, a lot of these people in my photos are, are gone now. Um, cause this, this project started back in 2004. This is Ted Priester, his favorite tree. Um, th this is um, a morning. This is 2012. Uh, just before th this is this the steel still making ended in, in 2012. This is early. Um, I think 2012. I mean, I know when it ended, but I think it's just it might be 2011. Um, but this is one of my favorite pictures. I, I'm there's there's a there's a few photographers that I look to. Um, for the for the the series that I'm working on, once Bill Brandt, B R A N D T, is a British photographer, um, worked in the 30s to the to the 70s, but really covered north 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 northern England. He's one of my my main inspirations for the style of these are these are shot in. Um, this is this is a, a ground behind the um, behind <coughs> mill used for dumping, um, but this. Uh, this photographer, Fred Lippert, he uh, is an amateur photographer, and he used to sneak onto the grounds and take photos. Now, this is Elizabeth. This is her one of her handmade flags. She's also disabled, also passed away. Uh, this is one of the handmade flags that, that she was making at the time with beads. Um, this this was this was inside the abandoned Union Hall uh, on, over on Dundalk Avenue, which was um, it's, all, it's gone now. It's pretty much gutted. Um, this, this is Lee Douglas. Uh, he's he was the first black shop steward in uh, at Bethlehem Steel Spares Point. Uh, very 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 important to um, to integrating the steel mills here in the, um, in Baltimore. Um, this is the old stainless steel plant. Uh, they they made the steel for the St. Louis Arch. Uh, this is where my grandfather worked. Uh, union, you know, mechanics union. Um, and the, yeah, this is this is shot, uh, you know, kind of a stormy day, but this is still there. And then they, they now make fake uh, wooden floors. Uh, this is a guy joke collected all the guests kind of badges and things that from the front gate. He had a, he had a great collection. He also has a built to scale size Bethlehem steel train garden. Um, this is this is in this is in uh, Johnstown. I took this. I was just fascinated by the way these, you know, unlike any other community I've been in, even in Bethlehem, I think um, these houses are really butt right up against these mills. It just you know, you're ha having a barbecue in the backyard is with this thing and like butting right up to it. You know, it, it's amazing. And I don't think you, I haven't seen anything like that since like maybe the photographs of like the shipbuilders, you know, on the Tyne in the UK where the boats were like at the end of your street. You know, like there was just a boat blocking the entire horizon so i wanted to give like a kind of claustrophobic um feel to these neighborhoods you know with this it kind of stops at the mill right there it's pretty wild this is an abandoned union hall in baltimore uh, stuff was pretty much rifled through um this is the abandoned union office basement of the union hall kind of a statement on bar culture um this is the union hall yeah, this this is this is Fred. Um, he's an amateur photographer. He snuck on the grounds with me, or had helped me sneak on the grounds and take photos. Um, unfortunately, this fantastic billboard is gone. Uh, about five years ago, somebody really, really like uh, graffitied over it, covered the whole thing, which is kind of sad. It, it was set back off the road. But um, this is a doctor's family. <laughs> wow. This small cemetery, like right in the middle of the mill property that's been reinterred um out in like hartford county I, I i found on a forum i was really curious I'm kind of fascinated by these graves there's only like four graves but this is the doctor from the 1800s was buried there and his family they, they moved those graves out um yeah this this was a tour i got i i, I want a few um because i i worked really closely with a lot of the workers down there uh, on, on you know the Bethlehem Steel Spares went closed like in bits, right? Like so, this this bit had been closed for about five years already. This is around 2010. The exact dates are on the on the um, in the book, and they're also on the uh, in in the museum show. Uh, so you know this is just just the the grass is kind of funny, you know, like the the, the heaviest stuff in the world, most the most fragile stuff in the world. You know, it's kind of a good uh, 
good thing on nature. Um, this is in Weirton. This is wild. Um, it, this is actually, if you look down here, there's a little person that is down here. So these walls are actually really high. Hmm. They're, they're, it's all gone now. This whole, this, all this complex is gone. It's torn down two years ago. Um, but this, this is just an amazing, you know, just, just the integration of industry and, and neighborhoods. You know, I mean, wow, it's a wonderful vista you got there, you know. Um, th th this was in, uh, this was in Steubenville. Um, you know, a lot of these steel towns weren't as big as Pittsburgh and Baltimore and, and really, really, really suffered. I mean, Baltimore is bad enough with redlining and stuff, but, you know, th th these towns are, are you know, quasi-abandoned. Um, it's just a few people walking around the streets. Uh, this is Weirton. Um, I, I took this because I, I was at in the early morning walking through like the entire city and the only people that I encounter were the people on these MIA and KIA signs uh, and being a vet I was just drawn right to it so um, th this is more from weird and this is gone this this complex is gone but more of the relationship between nature steel and kind of neighborhoods and human beings um, this is this isn't weird and also this is this is a, a high school that had skeletons all over it which I just thought was <laughs> really pressing harbinger um yeah this is baltimore again this is you can see him tearing down the mill bit by bit uh this is the union hall this is a shot uh when they just got the uh announcement that more benefits are being cut hmm. this is the union hall in baltimore uh this is the another announcement of benefits being cut she's not shielding her eyes from the camera she's disgusted by um the fact that benefits are getting cut again so this is the hall, um, the hall in Baltimore. This is a uh, in Mingo Junction. Um, trivia question: That's where they filmed the Deer Hunter. Um, this is a Mingo High School. I guess so all these people are are gone now, uh, and, and working in town. Um, this is this is Bill uh, Bordeaux. He was a Mohican, the Mohican tribe. He helped. He worked at Bethlehem Steel and helped build the the Bay Bridge. Did, a, did the high steel on the Bay Bridge. This is an abandoned Union Hall in Baltimore. Bar culture, love it. Everybody had one in their basement. Um, this is a, a drawer mark desk. Uh, this was in a safe uh, inside the Union Hall, these paintings that no one knew who this, this guy was. And there was more in there, but this is the most compelling shot. So, you know, you, you get all these people that are one time were like big wigs, now they're, they're completely forgotten and locked away kind of thing. So, uh, this is this is Serbia. No, I'm joking. This is the facade of um, of the Bethlehem Steel office uh, offices headquarters in Baltimore that was uh, blown off. It just looks like it just looks like a war zone. I mean, I know it's a cliche to say, but this literally looks like a building that's been bombed out. Um, they they just detonated, I guess, charges and ripped the whole facade off, and it was. Just you know, kind of undignified, and so sad to see this this main office building go because they had some really good like mid century modern in terms, you know, fifties uh, style. Uh, this is in one of the old mills. Um, this is a, a one of the steel workers that was showing me around. Um, this one was kind of snuck in. This is actually my grandfather receiving one of those awards. They gave awards for everything for like having glasses. They gave him an award for, you know, the owl, the order of the owl, just having glasses, I guess. Uh, very, very important here, uh, Eddie Barty and his son. You're looking at about 100 years of steel making between these two guys. They both worked for the mill for around 40 some years. Um, Eddie was really, really important in integrating the mills here in Baltimore. Morning home is Roy. Uh, this is in the UK. You see, there's, there's a there's a theme. You know, you these these you know steel steel workers in the mill they, they kind of run together, and that's the point. You know, like it's the same kind of shared experience across the world when these mills close down. This is in Turner Station. Another horse. It's so weird. This the horse theme running through this book is pretty wild. This there was a horse just wandering around in the back. By giving horse rides. This is a retiree in uh, um, in Turner Station. This this was from last year. You can see the COVID mask dates her, so it's ever kind of kind of like uh, like frozen. Um, yeah, this is Bud. Another the Bud. This is in his uh, 
in his um this is his living room <laughs> living room you can see from you know the kids pictures to the booze right so it's interesting it's an interesting dichotomy putting these together um this is a house in dundalk this uh, was interesting to me because i'd seen these these, these steelworker houses tend to be the same build and the same type really no matter where you are unless you're in like a city like say Bethlehem or something, um, but in these towns, they're kind of the same thing. Th this, these crosses represent victims of drug uh, overdoses, um, and you find a lot of that around these uh, former industrialized towns. A lot of yeah. uh, a lot of spikes in drug uses, things like that. See, this is a and, th and th this one is in um, this is in Wheeling, West Virginia. So you see, you saw the, the crosses, right? And then you have these. So it's two different, two different, completely different cities towns and it's still kind of the same idea you know so it's just interesting that narrative that, that rolls through this uh this is an abandoned store in steubenville mill office uh this is another mill morning um mostly going for more uh, geometrical shapes and shadows here the, the print of this looks really nice i'm really happy with the print of this um this is um this is bez he was this is his mill in the back. This is in Red Car in the UK. Um, he was, they, they just showed up one day to work in uh, 2012 and the locks were on the gate. There wasn't even a way to get back in. They just locked them out. This is it, the uh, retirees, um, the retirees benefit in Wheeling. These are the, these are the tracks that used to run. I think they, they just started using them again. This is all Amazon property now and all warehouses back here. Um, so these are the tracks that used to lead right into the into the mills. Uh, a little tip to the hat to Gene Smith here. He did this fantastic project in Pittsburgh. Uh, I had a little bit of that going on when I was taking this photo. He's another one of my inspirations for this year. I just I ordered his book finally. It's expensive. Um, yeah, this is this. So this is in uh, this is in Steubenville Bridge. This is the first Steuben Bridge, which is really interesting. This idealism and realism, you know, kind of right next to each other. Uh, this is in abandoned uh, part of abandoned Johnstown. My little buddy followed me around to about three or four buildings. Um, th this is in the this is in the the gatehouse from from Johnstown, and it's just like they they, they just left. You know, it's like they just they just left. Um, hey, okay, this, this picture. One minute left. Okay, I'll I'll end it on this one. You can, the rest of them are available at the museum. The, I I I swear, I swear to God, I found this just laying there inside the mill, mm. just with a bunch of stuff, and it's an election smashed hard hat. I, I, it couldn't have been a better photo to sum up, you know, kind of my entire project. But I, I promise you, it was not set up. I, I don't know how else to communicate to people, but it was not set up. So there we go. So that's that's that. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, well time to open it up for questions. Um, I don't see any in the moment in the chat, but I've got a couple here. Mm. Um, one is just, I'm kind of curious about your use of black and white photography versus color. And I know, Ed, you addressed that a little bit about the Baltimore photographs versus the Bethlehem photographs. Um, but so Joe, do you, maybe you want to begin and then we'll turn it over to Ed about, you know, why color or why black and white? Sure. Um, I get this question a lot, and like I tell my students, uh, if the color is not part of the context of the picture, it's, an, it's a distraction. Um, I really think you, you know, black and white is the language of photojournalism because it calls attention to the subject, uh, where color can distract from the subject in, in certain instances. And, and, you know, quite frankly, with the Steel series, there's not much color in it. It's a pretty monochrome series without being even black and white, excuse me. Um, some were shot in color and I converted because I had, I didn't have a film camera for a while, so I had to use digital. Um, but they were shot with black and white in mind. In other words, nothing in the, nothing in the photos that would have been in color would have taken your eye away from the subject. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the reason I shoot. And I, I just think black and white really makes you pay attention to the subject where color, if you know, um, kind of distracts from it. Yeah, it's it, it, many of these points are well taken. I, I agree absolutely with that. Um, you know, when I first started this, um, being a student, you know, um, <laughs> we were all using black and white film anyway, so I was kind of like drafted into it. But you know, just the uh, the lack of distraction 
of the color is a, is a, is a very important thing um, um, to think about. And, you know, as time goes on, um, as you're documenting uh, something, there's a continuity of, of your work. You have to, yeah, so it all comes together. Um, that's a very important thing. And, you know, when I go, when I went down to Baltimore to take pictures, portraits of the, the steelworkers down there, um, you know, I kind of wanted to separate the two bodies of work. And, and you know, I was looking at some of the the skin tones and the outfits were, were unbelievable. I was looking at them um, both in color and black and white. And I, in that case, I didn't think it was distracting. I thought it actually... Um, brought me more into the subject. Uh, it, it strengthened it. So sometimes, sometimes the color is very, very important. But uh, in general, you know, a lot of things that I've done uh, over time, I have um, gravitated towards black and white for for the reasons that have been explained. Great, thank you. Um, what about this? Is a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, can you talk about your relationship with your subjects? Do you keep in touch with them over the years or how do you get to know them? I'd be curious about that. Ed, do you want to go okay. first? Ed, sure, I'll go. Unmuted. Right. Well, a lot of the people that I I became in touch with, you know, that, that started with that theater production um, at, at Touchstone with Steelbound and with the Steelworkers Archive. So it's like, I kind of got brought into their family and um, there's like a level of trust and, and openness that exists there that if you're just coming in from the open, it, it feels a little different, you know? So it's it's not like, it's almost, as, it's as close as you can get to actually having the experience of working there. You know, and because you're dedicated towards the mission of like preserving their their contributions, uh, their memories, you know, they they take you, they kind of adopt you. <laughs> you know, it's like you're being become their their favorite teddy bear or, or doggy or, or however you want to term it. Um, and uh, it's a, it becomes an, an emotional and an intellectual journey. And uh, when I came down to Baltimore, you know, I brought those images with me and as a tool. To open up because I didn't have a chance to to um, um, pass you know grow up with those people or to interact with them over a long time so my my feelings were well I'm going to bring a little bit of my heart and my vision for them and and it was like they were at home and and it, that's that's when that's when things start to happen Joe, what about you? How what's your relationship with your subjects, and do you keep in touch with them over the years? <laughs> Unfortunately, most of mine are not no longer with us, um, so I don't really get a chance to talk to them. I, I did, um, you know, I, I did revisit a few of the workers when I was over at the, at the Dundalk paper. Um, I, I do send a Christmas gift to Bez every year from the UK. Um, usually a steer related book. So he's got Deborah's book. He's got one from the BMI. Um, yeah, he, he, he gets a, a yearly book. And I get I get a little nice thank you email. Um, so so that's it really, you know, the, the checks, um, you know, those mills over there, uh, there's really uh, up north, I was up on the Polish border and, you know, most of those big mills are gone. So there was really nobody to relate to. You know, I kind of come in after all the damage is done, you know, which, um, kind of stinks it's kind of uh kind of maudlin but yeah i, I don't um i mean bill barry who's a who's a, a, an oral chronicler of the, the I mean, he he talks to him all the time you know he hangs out with him um I, I don't have time because of the nature of my job to get over uh that way as much as i'd like so well i uh i see another question kind of on that note from bruce it says what is so compelling about this huge industry that has almost completely disappeared except for its shell that's made you want to document it. So Joe, you want to start and then we'll pass Yeah, it sure. Um, you know, it, it, it was, it was, it, it was the biggest industry in the country uh, for a long time and it collapsed for a number of reasons, some political, uh, some from the unions misusing money. Um, and it's just fascinating to me 
how these systems abandon people. You know, the people put their faith in these, you know, all, you know, there's, you know, there's corporate rhetoric, family, you're not family, you know, you're, you're, you're working to make somebody rich and that rich person is going to be rich no matter if you work there or not. So like, for instance, you know, for instance, uh, the person that took over Bethlehem steel in 20 in 2003, the head of the international steel group, um, you know, he, he went to jail. Oh no, sorry. It's Wilbur Ross. He became Trump's, um, financial secretary. Yeah. Sorry. So see, there's the point, right? The guy that destroyed the industry by basically saying, I'm buying these apartments. I don't have to take care of your people. And then kicked all the people out was, was awarded for that by the same people he kicked out in voting. And he became, you know, he became Trump's, you know, uh, um, financial secretary. So, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. There's a lot of disconnect, I think, between voters and what's good for them and what's not good for them and how they think. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's interesting to chronicle that, you know, and it's a sad part. It's going to happen with Walmart. It's going to happen with Amazon. Maybe not now, but 20, 30 years from now, it will collapse. And all these people that put their faith into this, into these monster companies are just going to end up by the wayside. Yeah, we can um, talk about I, clouds. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, you know, it's like I go, I, I keep thinking of this thing. You know, I, I had fortunately the ability of fo to photograph this thing over time when it was alive, but I could see that it was it was dying, and you know, it really, um, it's almost like a guidebook for the future of of things that were done right, what to do, and what not to do. And I think that um, I, you know, I think that through that, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to like, um, I guess you you want to save the future. You know, I was asked once when I presented this stuff, why are you presenting such a depressing picture? Give us some hope. And I, I said that was part of the purpose, is to you know enlighten and and to um, um, to say, hey, you know, this is what happened, and and what are you going to do with it? How are you going to interpret it, and where? How are you going to project that into the future? Thank you. All right, now question about the composition from Sandy. The clouds in many of the photos seem to be part of the framing context and subject. Was that intentional? Joe, Ed, I don't know who wants to go first. There, jump in. Yes, that was intentional. Um, clouds are fantastic. Clouds are great. Um, they, they really, yeah, they, they really make a good, uh, kind of a, a good compositional tool. Um, especially like dark hanging, like moody, but cause it's what you want to convey, you know, for the, for the, the picture that, um, was on the flyer, the vertical shot of Bethlehem steel, which I, I didn't get a chance to get to in my presentation. Um, I mean, those clouds and those myths and those things around it, um, they really, really drove home that. You know that sad, depressing, you know Christmas feeling um, in the photograph. So um, yeah, so I do. Yeah, it, it is. And sometimes I'll wait until we get a nice cloudy day. I mean, because you know blank skies are blank skies, right? Especially when you shoot in black and white. Um, and also, it, it because it's gray, it brings a lot more detail in the subjects. So let's say like overhead sunlight. Ed, what about you? Clouds? What, it's whatever it? whatever presents itself at the time. I mean, it depends on, you know, and that's like an act like something I can't control, uh, like a, an act of nature. I mean, sometimes we, I mean, there was a very, and this isn't even related to the steel stuff. I, I had taken a photograph that was widely used by the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund in Washington DC and it was um it was the sun was like beaming through these clouds at the exact moment and it was like heaven a heavenly look and I and somebody just happened to touch it at that moment and I took the picture you know sometimes you, you'll see things like that with art you know like with industrial forms sometimes it's with humans and sometimes it it works sometimes it doesn't so it's a matter of the moment and 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 if you think it could work or not. Thank you. 
Um, all right, we've got a question from Kara. Joe, you mentioned you're a high school teacher. Um, how do you show or impart your work with the students and what's their response? Um, that's a good question. I don't actually impart my work on them. Um, I, I like to make, I teach high school. So um, I teach at an arts high school um, and I teach black and white dark room. So it's all developing and processing. Um, so I, I try to, I think it's kind of narcissistic. I don't know why. I'm just that, I don't want to be that professor that's like, you have to buy my book for the class type thing. Um, so I, I, they, a lot of them follow me on Instagram, which I allow. Um, the policy is like, we usually don't follow, I don't follow students, like, but my Instagram is all professional. So there's no, it's just all my work. So they can follow me on there. They can see what I do. And most of them look at my, they, they seek it out. But I, I, I try to teach the history of photography and um, you know, the, the, the classics and things like that. I don't really teach my work. I'm not here to talk about my stuff. You know, this is why I'm not a rich photographer living in New York. So. Great, thank you. Um, we've got time for probably one more question if anyone has one from the audience. But in the meantime, I've got one for you guys. Um, what has changed as we get further and further removed from the heyday of the steel industry um, in terms of your process and also the, the products, the photographs? Whoever wants to jump in well, first. I guess I could do that for some. I think with the introduction of digital photography, I think that it has had a significant impact on, uh, in, in terms of what you're saying. Um, the challenge is, though, and, and I speak of that continuity uh, from the past and how we process those images, how we compose those images. And I try to keep things as close to the darkroom process as possible. I mean, those of us who have actually uh, worked with the darkroom understand how these materials work and how they how they present themselves. So when you when you pick the camera, when you pick the lens and how you process it, I, I always tell people when I work in in Photoshop, it's my dry darker. <laughs> you know, it, it, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, the dodging, the burning, you know, I, I like to use the clone stamp. Um, I mean, what I'll do is I'll like I'll put out like five different versions of the same picture out. I'll adjust each one independently and combine them all in, in, like I would be painting. And it's interesting because like I, my background is in drawing and painting first before it became photography. So I treated it as that. And, and a lot of those things are still incorporated. But, you know, sometimes with the digital, you have, um, you know, some things look too digital. And, 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 but it makes you way more efficient. You know, the, the ability to get things out and to send them. I mean, I, I don't ever see myself going back uh, to the film only in very specialized circumstances, maybe eight by 10 view camera or something. It's really been, it's really been a godsend, but at the same time, it can be a curse, you know, and, and there's some really fantastic work that's out there. You know, I, like David Turnley is a, uh, is an amazing photojournalist. And if you look at his work, I mean, very film, very organic, and yet he uses a digital camera. And actually we both use the same camera. I'm like, partial to, I use a lot of Leica equipment that I've accumulated over the years, but now I'm into digital. Um, but you know, that I think that goes along the lines of what, what you were asking. Yeah. Joe, what about you? What, what changes have you seen over time in relation to the steel industry photos? Um, really, I mean, <laughs> nothing these things keep closing down and people keep losing their benefits bit by bit you know um they're not you know we've gone from a manufacturing country to a distribution warehouse country um so the jobs aren't really making things and there, there's still mills in the country i mean it's not 100 percent bleak you know but there's nowhere near the output as it was before um i i don't do any you know i don't do any kind of uh, manipulation in my photos like I, if i turn it to if I switch it to monochrome, that's about as far as I go. Um, I might do some burning and dodging, but I don't do anything that I can't do in the dark room. Uh, now I'm shooting more film. So, um, you know, it's, it's more, I have a panoramic camera, this Russian panoramic camera that's pretty cool. Um, that I got some some of the check shots of. But um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm kind of, this, it's the same, you know, I people aren't getting employed in this industry anymore. And the whole industry is these, these lands are being repurposed for 
you know, it, it's amazing to me, at least at least in Baltimore, in that area where the where the steel mill was, um, within five years, it's reverted back to the ninth. Right. You have no union at will jobs, right? R run by massive companies. Um, so it's just wild. You know, it's getting it's getting a little better. You know, the Amazon, the Amazon unions are kind of creeping in, which is kind of good and that kind of stuff. But you know, like like until recently there was nothing like that down there. Great. Well, I think we are just about out of time. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I'd just like to thank each of you for spending the last hour sharing some of your work. Um, if you have any links you wanna drop in the chat for people to learn more about your work or your projects or upcoming other projects, feel free to do that. And um, thanks to all of you for tuning in today from look like a few different locations. And again, this is part of Steel Weekend programming out of the National Museum of Industrial History in Bethlehem. So if you are local to that area, go check those out um, and we're delighted to participate in that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.